Thank you so much for joining today. Um, just introduce myself. My name is Sarah. I'm a fourth year medical student at UCSF, and I'm so excited to be co-discussing a case with Robbie today. Um, so thank you for joining and thank you for attention this morning. Robbie, how are you doing? I'm doing really well. I don't know if people know, um, Sarah and I go a long way back, literally to the beginnings of your journey in internal medicine, where we were on the same uh, medicine wards team together. And um, it's been really, really cool to see you um, join this team and crushing it on scribing and teaching points. And I'm excited to um, to share the the stage with you today. I find it kind of cool and a nice mix of things that it's a very small crowd here at 6.30 in the morning on in the Pacific coast, um, early many other places too, not in Graz where Sammy is hanging out. Um, but yeah, if you, uh, if you are here and it's a small crowd, please, please, please turn your video on if you can. That would be amazing. Um, and um, if anybody has a case, please, please, please let us know. In the meantime, Sarah, tell us a little bit about how it feels to like to be jumping into this space. Yeah, I have always admired the people who take this spot of being a discusser for these cases. Um, it's like a huge effort to, I think, both process and like talk at the same time. Um, so I just want to be able to hone that skill like everyone else has over time. Um, so yeah, I'm just super excited to um, continue learning and continue growing in this in this space. 100%. It's a little nerve wracking for sure. Um, but yeah, no, I love that. I love that enthusiasm and that vigor to push yourself over and over and over again. Um, anyone have a case for Sarah? Oh, no way. Nikita, we haven't seen you in forever. Welcome back. How are you? I don't know if you're able to unmute. Hello. Hello. I'm doing good. How are you all? I'm doing very well. What's new with you? Um, nothing much really. I mean, I was supposed to be in Boston a week ago because I'm starting a research here, but then I've got some visa issues that are delaying everything. So yeah. I'm just sticking around at India for a while, but it's been going really well. It's been a while since I've come to this space. Yeah, so I'm excited yeah. to join you all today. Yeah, it's so nice to have you here and good luck with your visa. I know it can be a big, 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 big struggle, but really, really nice to see you here. Deborah is so also much. here. Hello, Deborah. Nice to see you. Every, I feel like if I just call on people to turn their video on. Hi, Austin. Oh, so nice to see you. Hi, Matt. Hi, Noah. Please, please, please turn your video on if you can. Deborah, what's up? How are you? I'm good. How about you guys? Good, good, good. It's too early in California, no? I know. It's pretty early. Yeah, it's really, really early. Mm -hmm. Oh, there he is. Oh, hello. Hi, Austin. Hi, Motaz. Nice to see you. Austin, what are you up to today? I don't have to work this morning, so I woke up to see your pretty face and learn about clinical reasoning, and that's why I look a mess, so I apologize to everyone. No, no, it's so great to see you. Thank you for hanging out with us. Motaz, you turned your video on for a second. It was so cool. How is your day going? Oh, we lost him. Uh-oh. Back to the faceless screen we go. We miss you already. All right, one last call for a case. Oh, Maddie, I just saw your message. Um, looks like Sammy and or Maddie have a backup case. How do you want? How do you, how do y'all want to do it? Up to you. I don't know what you've been communicating here. Yeah. Sammy, what uh, what do you what do you prefer? Yeah, I just pulled up one from my Human DX archives that I'd saved, so I think we can go through that. But it's yeah, it's just the case. But I think it okay. will be open. And if I say I have um, an outpatient one, that's like a, a real life one that I can share. It's um, not quite as curvy, that, like interesting as a human DX case, but we can do that one as well. Sarah, you yeah. get to choose. You want oh my gosh. Life? You want real life or you want human DX? Um, I'll go for real life. Ooh. <laughs> 
I love it. I'm not the least bit surprised. <laughs> Thank you, Maddie. Thank you, Sammy, for um, always Thank having you. me. Yeah. All right, we'll kick it off. Do you want us to start us off, Maddie, with a chief concern? We'll babble away before. Um, yes. Yeah. So, um, the chief concern is left sided hearing loss. Uh, and this is an outpatient setting. Okay. I'll just give you that. Yeah. So, left sided hearing loss. Um, the first thing I think of is like, where is the problem? Is it going to be in the ear itself? Is it going to be the nerve that travels to the ear or is it going to be somewhere in the brain? So I think that's my first um, thought. And then the th things that can do this inflammation, infection, mass effect from either something like a malignancy or something like um, an abscess. So I'd want to know if there are any like localizing signs or other focal, focal neurological defects. Tara, that's absolutely superb. I can't believe you said so much and so much brevity. And I, I want to actually slow down and emphasize one thing you said, which is your localization wasn't uh, ear or brain. It was ear, nerve, and brain. I think that's really, really important because often when we're worried about um, hearing loss, we're often, we often worry about the brain causes, but the nerve causes are actually fairly distinct from the uh, ear causes. And in some sense, you're trying to break it up. Is it central, peripheral? And within peripheral, is it a conductive or is it sensory neural? And I think that initial branch point is really, really informative. Um, yeah, I have nothing to add to that except to emphasize that it's a three-pronged localization, not a two-pronged one. Uh, the ear, the nerve, and the brain. That is awesome. All right, Maddie, tell us more. All right, fantastic start already. So um, to give you a little bit more of an HPI, so this is a 74, excuse me, 47, just, just mixed up those uh, numbers, 47 year old man um, who has a past medical history of HIV, migraines, and a prior syphilis infection who is presenting to the, an HIV primary care clinic with five days of hearing loss in his left ear. So he denies any ear pain or ear drainage from the left ear. He also denies any um, discomfort on the right side. So no right-sided hearing loss, no right-side um, ear pain. He does report that he had a, a sore throat earlier this week. Um, so a little bit before the hearing loss started. Um, on review of systems, he's noticed some decreased sensation over the left side of the face for the past few days. Um, when asked if he's experienced this before, he said that um, over the past year, sometimes he notices intermittent decreased sensation of the left side of the face and that that sensation is more apparent during his migraine episodes. Um, he doesn't have a history of recurrent ear infections. He says he only remembers having some ear infections as a child. Um, and interestingly, so he presented to the same, so, you know, I saw him on a, in a primary care clinic on like a Thursday. He presented to the same primary care clinic like three days before um, with the same concern of hearing loss and decreased facial sensation, decreased facial sensation. Um, Given, you know, the provider at that time, given their concern for a possible cranial nerve deficit in the setting of new onset hearing loss, this person was sent to the ED for further evaluation, um, but left without being seen. He actually was, um, went through withdrawal um, at, in the ED, was like very uncomfortable and left without being seen. That's why he kind of came back several days later to this primary care clinic. Wow, that's oh, such a rich history. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, I have a lot of different thoughts, but I'll try to distill it into just a couple. Um, the first is that the past medical history for this patient gives a lot of reason to think that there may be some kind of focal neurological finding. Um, for example, like the history of migraines, the history of HIV, and then the history of uh, syphilis, which can um, I learned the other week can cause, there's like an otosyphilis phenomenon um, that can occur. Um, not, and then um, the other, the other question that I want to ask is, um, did 
he specify whether or not his symptoms were intermittent or if they had persisted throughout the three-day time course? That's a great question. I, I think he would, I don't remember explicitly asking, but my sense is that this has been bothering him pretty consistently. Okay. So not intermittent, more consistent. I see. Um, and then this other, this other finding of um, uh, the decreased sensation in the face um, makes me think that another cranial nerve is involved, um, the trigeminal nerve. So I feel like I'm more localizing towards, um, I feel like maybe that pushes my localization towards like brain or brainstem, but I'm not 100% sure. Robbie, what do you think? Yeah, um, Sarah, I think that's absolutely fantastic. I agree with you about the medical history and about the, the that when you have multiple cranial nerves involved, you have to think about the brainstem for sure. Um, and I think that, you know, the challenge that you're probably having in real life here is that um, that sensation is a very tricky thing to assess objectively uh, and trying to gauge the severity of that. Um, it's also helpful to remember that the trigeminal nerve has three separate branches. So it's going to be really important to figure out, is it all three V1, V2, V3, or is it a, a segment of it? Um, as a general rule of thumb, you, whenever you have multiple um, nerves involved, you want to try to see, is it, when you have multiple distributions involved, you want to try to see where they, uh, where the common denominator is and elegantly think of a solution in the common denominator. But it is true that you could have multiple peripheral uh, neuropathies at the same time. So for example, if somebody comes in with bilateral lower extremity weakness, it could be Guillain-Barre, multiple peripheral nerves at the same time. It could be cauda equina, where the nerves come together, or it could be in the cord. And I think here you could say, is are multiple cranial nerves involved, cranial nerve five and cranial nerve eight? Or are they involved in a place that they coalesce to earlier before they get to the brainstem, the equivalent of cauda equina? And that happens um, in some cranial nerves. So uh, for example, cranial nerve seven and cranial nerve eight are close together enough in the lateral geniculate nucleus before the uh, a brainstem that they can get disease there. Cranial nerves three, four, uh, and six are close enough together in the cavernous sinus that they can disease, get disease there. So whenever you're thinking multiple, multiple nerves together, use the more common example of bilateral leg weakness to be like, is it the nerve, is it the cauda equina, and, or is it the cord, to remind you that it can be the nerve simultaneously, that it can be uh, the place where the nerves get closer to each other but aren't part of the same structure, the cauda equina, or the same structure, the cord. And here, I think the fact that it's five, cranial nerve five and cranial nerve eight, I think the distance between them is too high for me to come up with a localization outside the brainstem, but then that may be a gap in my knowledge. It may be that they're close together enough at some point, somewhere in the face that a peripheral process might be affecting them simultaneously. But I think the challenge now is you're confident that you can't do anything really to make progress on the sensory symptoms from an exam perspective, but you can make tremendous progress on um, uh, localizing the ear problem with your exam. And I say that because you could have a space occupying disease process in the ear causing conductive hearing loss that is then metastasizing and spreading into the face causing cranial nerve five. So the localization may be uh, anatomic compression of five as a result of an invasive process affecting hearing. So I would be cautious to um, not make the error of assuming that both these are from the same mechanism. All right, Maddie, tell and us more. I, oh, yeah, go can ahead. Can I ask so, one more question? Yeah, please, Was there awesome. any like facial droop? Great question. No facial droop, like as we're like asking this history, um, that's obvious. No facial droop, that's obvious. Thank you. All right, so to give you a little bit more information. So as I said, he has a past medical history of HIV infection that is actually very well controlled. So his last CD4 count was 505 and his viral load is undetectable. Um, he, as I mentioned, has a his, uh, prior um, syphilis infection. Um, first, back in July of 2019, when I was reading through the notes, it said that actually in 2019, he uh, was diagnosed with neurosyphilis and was treated with IV penicillin at that time. Um, then his RPR was um, non-reactive in 2020. Um, you know, most recently I kind of went back to look at the RPRs. Um, the highest was back in April of 2021 when it was one to 512. 
At that time, he was hospitalized for empiric, empiric IV penicillin. Um, he did have actually um, a recent RPR um, this past summer that was one to 16. Um, and since that time, he, uh, he says he's only had one sexual partner who's well engaged in care and who like does not have syphilis, um, according to this patient. So that's a little bit of information about prior syphilis. Um, he does have um, polysubstance use, um, most recently with fentanyl. Um, he that's kind of explains that when he went to the ED the few days prior, he was going through withdrawals. Um, Let's see, uh, family history, non-contributory uh, health related behaviors I mentioned is kind of most notable for polysubstance use with um, fentanyl. Um, for medications, he's on his antiretrovirals for HIV, he's on Victarvi. So jumping to the vitals. Um, so the vitals are all normal, blood pressure 123 over 86, heart rate 79, siding 100% on room air. So in general, um, he doesn't appear to be in acute distress, but it's kind of like um, touching his left ear and just feels like pretty um, like annoyed by it. Um, for the H E E N T, so when we looked inside the ear, so for the left ear, the external you know auditory canal was intact. Um, when we looked in, the tympanic membrane was intact, but we thought we saw what seemed to be like an erythematous um, and kind of bulging tympanic membrane with what looked like some inflammation, potentially um, an, an effusion. Um, the right side was um, completely normal. The right side of the external auditory canal was intact. Um, there did appear to be like a good amount of wax. Uh, in terms, so we did the hearing test. So we got the tuning fork out and we, you know, placed it in the middle of the forehead and uh, the patient said it localized to the left. So then we did the Renee test where you try to see if it's, you know, air greater than bone conduction. Um, and interesting on both sides, the patient thought that the air was louder than the bone. Um, so then we did, you know, we were really concerned about all the cranial nerves. So, um, you know, the tongue protruded midline, there were no lesions, um, shoulder shrug was five out of five, um, voice was without any strider, um, kind of the tongue, there was no white coating or anything like that. Um, cardiovascular normal, pulmonary normal, abdominal exam normal. Um, I guess a little bit more about the cranial nerves. So um, for ocular three, four and six were intact. For five, um, the patient did say there was diminished sensation for kind of all three branches, just on the left. On the right um, was normal. And the rest of the neuro exam was unremarkable. Um, we did ask him to walk and there was no changes in his gait. Um, and I'll just pause there. Great exam, Maddie. Thank you so much for sharing. I think um, the first I'll address the past medical history really quickly. Um, based on the HIV history, opportunistic infections become way less likely. Um, and then the syphilis history is interesting. I'm not sure what to make of the titers changing uh, without treatment, it seems. Um, and then for the exam, um, the exam is notable for um, this localized finding in the left ear with the uh, erythematous and bulging um, tympanic membrane, which makes me think of there's something infectious or um, inflammatory going on in the left ear itself. Um, and then the hearing tests uh, signifies, <laughs> if, if my step knowledge is serving me well, that there is sensory neural hearing loss on, that, on the left side, um, but that could be totally misremembering. Um, the neuro exam, the fact that the all three branches of the trigeminal nerve are um, are affected make me either think again like brainstem the nucleus or um, the nerve just coming off the brainstem or I I think I remember that the main like where the um, where the nerves meet before they branch off is like around this area so the fact that there's like 
a local, what looks like ear infection and also um, all three branches of the nerve are infected make me also think that it could be some like local process in this area um, that is causing this hearing loss and sense, uh, facial sensation um, deficit. Tara, this is so tricky and so well articulated. I, I, uh, I think that interpreting the syphilis history is tricky. What you want to see is the patient have a fourfold drop in their RPR after treatment. So my math isn't that great, but 516, five, one to 500 to one to 16 seems like the patient had a fourfold drop, but you want to make sure that it actually didn't drop even further and then went back up which might suggest um, a reinfection. But I think with the data that Maddie had access to, I think the most logical conclusion is that the patient had a titer that went from super high to like decently high. Um, but of course, the caveat could be that in between the two titers that were measured, the patient could have gone to undetectable that went back up to one to 16. So you have to be a little careful with that. Um, so hard to know for sure, but I think objectively you can say there was a fourfold drop, so likely treated syphilis. And... Um, I, I, I love the, the localization that you're coming up with, where you're saying, hey, I see something in the ear and I they know there's something wrong with the trigeminal nerve. So I'm going to connect them anatomically rather than through a neurological issue. And I think um, I think this, the thing that you're dealing with here is actually a little bit tricky. So I'm going to take a minute to try to explain that. Um, and think about it this way, Sarah, when your patient comes in and they are like, I can't hear out of my left ear and you do a maneuver, i.e. you put a tuning fork right in the middle of their head and then they look back at you funny. They look back at you funny because they're like, wait, hold on. It's louder in the ear that I can't hear in. That's weird. And there's always a little bit, whenever I do this, which is probably like once a week uh, in the ED, they're always like, how did you do that? Like, what's the magic trick where my ear, I couldn't hear out of it, but Maddie puts the tuning fork and all of a sudden it's way louder in that ear. It's way louder in that ear because the unaffected, unaffected ear here, the right side, is hearing the noise in the room and is hearing the tuning fork. And those two things cancel each other out such that the tuning fork is heard less in the unaffected ear. However, in the left ear, if the tuning fork is louder, it must mean that the tuning fork is not being subtracted from the ambient noise in the room. And which tells you that the patient has a blockage in their pathway to the nerve, which is suggestive of conductive hearing loss. And it's so cool to do this in real life because your patients think you're like some sort of magician where you're like, oh, my ear doesn't work, but you made it work so well. And that I think will stick with you in real life whenever, uh, uh, whenever you do see it. So the summary is the Weber test is the best test to help distinguish between sensory, neural, and conductive hearing loss. When the unaffected, when the affected ear all of a sudden becomes magically healed, it's because you are bypassing air conduction by conducting through the bone and ambient noise is no longer diminishing that signal in the previously diseased ear, which you have cured by bypassing it. So we didn't fall for the trap, Sarah. Maddie was like, hey, cranial nerve five, cranial nerve eight, I got you. No, I think we narrowly escaped. And now the harder thing for you to think about is now that we're saying the ear is non-neurologic, non um, we're essentially left with a neuro issue that is complete loss of all versions of the trigeminal nerve, V1, V2, and V3, all of them gone. But, but the patient has no other neurological deficits whatsoever. So the whole trigeminal nerve, all of it, but nothing else. How does that jive with you? What does that make you think of? Or what does that do to you reflexively? Um, it makes me think like less, it, it just makes me think less brain because most likely if there's some like mass process or inflammatory process that's affecting the tri the whole trigeminal nerve it's big enough to affect other other nerves as well 100% i couldn't agree more with you i think that's the most logical conclusion and the most firm conclusion i can come up with the other that i come up with is gosh um when somebody else yawns i yawn when somebody else feels nauseous i feel queasy when my left ear is not working well 
I'm not too surprised that I just feel weird and might feel numb on that side. And I think you have to be very careful with sensory symptoms because they may represent sensory pathology or they may represent transposition of a symptom complex that has nothing to do with a sensory symptom. And I think if somebody is really, really worried about their left ear, I think it's very easy for me to see that worry translate into a symptom complex of that it doesn't feel or it doesn't feel right on that side. And so I don't know if the sensory symptoms map onto a neurological problem or map onto extreme, a manifestation of concern about a conductive hearing loss. And I think that the, the reason I'm suspicious of the latter is because too much of the trigeminal nerve is affected without anything else going on. And it's on that same side. So um, I don't know. I think what I would follow, uh, the, the path that I would follow is, um, is the, the conductive hearing loss. And I think, um, I don't know if I would push for an MRI brain quite yet um, because of what you said. So I'm really, really curious uh, what Maddie did, but I think to summarize, this is very likely conductive hearing loss and very likely the bulging TM is the explanation for that. Um, and the trigeminal nerve may be on the hook pathophysiologically or maybe an innocent bystander in a symptom complex that is appreciable concern about the ear. How does that jive with you? Yeah, that makes a ton of sense to me. Um, and I think it also makes me think of a couple of other diagnoses. Could I like throw them out for you? Now? Or uh, some other like ma kind of management things about what we can do to work this up. Yeah. Um, I also remember that anatomically, like any backup from like kind of the oral pharynx area can cause both um, like uh, effusions in the ear um, as well as some like sensation. Um, deficits. So I'm wondering what you would do to like, instead of an MRI, would you kind of pursue like pan endoscopy? I guess there's no evidence of like extensive smoking history or anything like that to make you think of like a nasopharyngeal cancer or something like that. Yeah. I mean, in a patient with HIV, I think you have to think about that for sure, because tumors can arise in the oropharynx independent of the CD4 count for sure. I think the only thing that would temper my enthusiasm to do that right away would be that, that the fact that you have time. Um, and I would, if this persists for much longer, then I think uh, imaging is important. I think in many situations where your access to resources may be limited, I think it's justifiable to say, I'm going to give this patient antibiotics for otitis media and, and, uh, and see how um, they respond to it. And if they don't respond, pursue imaging. I think that in the context of the recent URI, you might think that um, uh, otitis media occurred in that context as opposed to URI phenomenon. And then also to think about mycoplasma, uh, mycoplasma causing bullous um, or advanced meningitis or um, tympanic membrane disease. Um, because the treatment for that would be a little bit different than the amoxicillin we would give. It would be azithromycin. So I think the tension here is, do you have enough to just empirically treat the patient and watch to see their treatment outcome? Or should you pursue advanced testing of either the um, upper airway or the brain? Um, I don't know what I would do. It would probably be really dependent on um, getting a sense of the acuity from the patient's body language more so than anything. And also, of course, his, uh, his preferences. Maddie, what'd you do? Right. Fantastic discussion. So um, what we did next is, as I said, the patient had just come to the primary care clinic a few days earlier. So we went to just double check kind of the labs that were obtained at that time. So an RPR um, was taken and it um, was continued to be very low. I can't pull up the EMR right now, but it was very low. Um, the labs were also like nothing remarkable, kind of assumed that they were unchanged and normal. So um, Really, so at this point, the, the doctor that I was with wanted to have kind of another expert look into the ear, because uh, kind of the summary is that the doctor who saw this patient a few days prior, I think, on their exam, thought that there was more evidence of a cranial nerve deficit, so they were concerned for um, potential neurosyphilis. They hadn't gotten like the, the updated RPR at that time, so that's why the um, person had sent them to the ED. Um, but by the time they came back and we found that the RPR was low um, and our exam didn't show any notable cranial nerve deficits. Um, what ended up happening is we 
refer the patient to an ENT clinic. I guess we're at this clinic, you can just send them down to like an outpatient ENT clinic. So they were able to see them right after us. Um, and from the note that I looked at, it basically their exam they thought was consistent with acute otitis media of the left ear. So they recommended um, a 10 day course of Augmentin and then returning in two weeks. Um, it has not yet been two weeks. So um, I haven't, um, I, don't, I didn't see an updated note of kind of coming back and seeing how, um, how the patient is doing, but uh, that's kind of, that's how it ended. Wow. Yeah. I have to remember like common things being common, <laughs> like <laughs> otitis media is very high on the differential. So that was like great for me to just remember. And then exactly what, um, just kind of going back to the diminished sensation. So we, yeah, we kind of also thought, I think you and Robbie mentioned it in the last aliquot that with just like irritation of the left ear, it was just kind of causing some discomfort on the left side of the face. There was also the element that this person had recurrent migraines and that and said that this sometimes comes on with migraines. So it, I mean, we weren't entirely sure kind of what to make of it, but we're felt a little bit reassured that it wasn't a sign of a cranial nerve deficit in the setting of neurosyphilis. That's kind of what the, the scare was like the, when he came in a few days prior. Oh man, this is un unreal case. And I think Sarah, just to emphasize the point that you just made at the end, about referral of the issues from the upper airway into the ear is I think the most important way to connect this because that's how URIs translate into otitis media is not, not through um, the most morbid thing would be something somebody has a mass in their upper airway blocking their eustachian tube and that causing buildup of fluid, but more likely they get a URI, they get transient ciliary dysfunction or even mucus impacting an occlusion and that refers a problem to the ear. So that connection that you made at the end is, is really, I think, what probably synthesizes this whole case. And I think you were given a really challenging case today, even though the final diagnosis is acute otitis media, I think the context of HIV, the syphilis looming large, the concomitant cranial nerve issue that had you thinking cranial nerve seven, and I think you really, really had to rush towards esoteria in a case like this for very good reason. The patient, the patient's risk factors and the patient's presentation should make you think that. But it's a great reminder that even in patients for whom there are some um, rare and sinister diagnoses at play, base rate will always, always, always um, uh, probably be the dominant variable. So um, yeah, how did it feel to discuss this? <laughs> it was just fascinating, just being able to say what I was thinking um, in the moment. Cause I think even when we like give presentations on rounds on in the wards, we have a lot of time to think about it. So um, I really appreciate being able to just say what I'm thinking and get like the direct feedback. Like I totally forgot about the Weber test and I appreciate that teaching. And yeah, I'm super excited to do this again and keep getting better. I love it. I think that's so inspiring to hear. And I think the same, you know, I, um, I, um, I learned about the Weber in real, I, I never really understood it as a trainee. And then I learned about it when I just did it. And I saw the look on my patient's face who was like, you're magical, which is of course not true. Um, like, how did you do that? And it forever stuck since that moment. So I hope that moment for you came today, but if it doesn't, I'm sure it'll come in real life. It's really, really cool to see somebody is hearing. It's like restoring sight, you know, like, oh, wow, you can see again. Oh, wow, I can hear again. It's pretty cool. And Maddie, thank you for presenting this case. Honestly, I think we need a lot more of these cases on VMR um, to balance us out from um, the crazy diagnoses we've had <laughs> this past week, which I won't say out loud in case people haven't listened to uh, cases, but it's been a bonkers week on VMR in terms of esoteria. So I'm glad we have acute otitis media on. Um, and let us know when you know uh, what happens to the patient. We'd love to um, hear how this ends up. Uh, yeah, Deborah, thank you for the teaching points. We'll pass the mic to you to take it home. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Maddie, for this case. Great discussion, Sherry and Robbie. So going for the teaching point, we started with the hearing loss and we think about the location. If it's in the ear, in the nerve, or in the brain, with the differential diagnosis, it could be an inflammation, an infection, or it could be a mass. And we have a great photo in the chat that we can ask the patient to make a hemium sound and block one of the ears with a finger if the sound lateralized. 
the data that is impaired it probably could be conductive and but if lateralized for the contralateral ear that suggests it's tensor tensor tensorial neuro hearing loss uh, and we look for the past medical history. The patient had like HIV, syphilis, migraine. So we look for the titles of the syphilis. And going for the symptoms, the patient had not just the hearing loss, but the the face, that decreased sensation of the face. So we thought that could be um, more than one cranial nerve involved. It could be the same mechanism or different one. And we we had the V1, V2, and V3 all from the the trigeminal, and we we had and Robbie said that it could be something neurologic or something in the conductive loss, and we go through the Weber test that could be conductive if the loss can be heard best in the abnormal ear and sensorineural if could be better heard in the normal ear, and yeah, and then Tara gave us the connection between the upper air, the upper respiratory airway in the ear that could be like something, a mass or a mucus. So yeah, thank you so much for this case and I hope to see you all this week. Deborah, you made us sound so much smarter than, than we were really. That was such an <laughs> incredible distillation of the teaching. Thank you. All right, y'all, hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thanks everyone.